And uh, we have been happy and uh, we are glad to have had our visitors from Future Health Africa the whole time and, and even uh, uh, teaching us and, uh, and uh, actually giving us that experience of uh, advanced uh, technology and Thank you, um, thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you, everyone, for having us, FHA, in Kenya. We, we do love coming, and we're very, very pleased to be here. And this time, I get to do a CME, which is also a pleasure, and I hope you won't all fall asleep straight away. Um, there was a poster, which I'm glad that Duncan did put up. I was smiling insanely, because it was taken in the airport as I was coming to Kenya. <clears throat> and I'm so pleased to be coming, that's why I was smiling so much, not because I was doing the talk this morning. Um, but I'm pleased to talk about Club Foot, and I'm trying not to make it all a, a load of slides, although I have got a whole talk, and if anyone is interested, I'm going to give the talk to Duncan uh, by email, and if you want a copy, you're very welcome to ask him for one. So Club Foot, um, you can see a couple of photographs there which um, may prompt your memory. And uh, I'm just going to run through these things. I'm going to try not to use the slides too much, um, but actually find out a bit about what you know and what you want to know about this. Um, I've been talking a lot with James, who runs the Club Foot Service here, supervised by Dr. Mbanya. Um, he's doing an excellent job. So I know he's seen Club Feet. But who else? Can we have a show of hands? Who has seen real live club foot before? Okay, is that anyone? There, there are a couple of hands that aren't up, but this clearly it's quite common. So um, starting on this side, can someone say what? You put your hand up, did you? You did. What's your name? Cynthia. Cynthia, how old was the patient that you saw with club foot? Three days off, okay. Can anyone um, beat the age in terms of going up? How, how, what's the oldest anyone's seen a patient with club foot? Untreated club foot. Uh, how old? 12 years old in primary school, untreated club foot. Okay. Anyone got a bigger, a higher than 12? Uh, high school classmate at club foot. Say again? High school club classmates. High school classmates yeah. have club foot untreated. Yeah. Wow. And what was the. You've seen older, haven't you, in Denver? How old are you? I don't think I've been old. 56, you can untreated. At 56, okay. Well, I'm, you, you could tell us a whole heap of stories about his life, and because of your understanding of it, that would be fascinating. And, and, but I'm just going to ask a 12 year old in high school, what were his troubles? What troubles did he have at high school? Uh, he okay, he mostly copied it, but he had to get a special shoe made for him. He had a special shoe made for him. Yeah. Sounds expensive. <coughs> yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was it one side or both sides? Just one. Just one side. Yeah. Could he run fast? Yeah. Could he run fast? Did he walk? Did you see him without his shoes on at any point? No. No. Was he embarrassed about it? Not really. No, that's good. Yeah. Um, does anyone know any girls, older girls who have club foot? 
or had come from the millions. Because sometimes, well, I certainly in, in Bangladesh, I've done some treatment of clubfoot, and the girls, it's a real problem because often they can walk and they can run, but there's no way they could get married. It's just socially unacceptable. They couldn't, they couldn't get married, couldn't find a partner and have a family. Um, and so it's quite culturally dependent. In fact, the function is very good, and often, even if they're walking on the foot that's um, really turned over, they're almost working walk on top of the foot. Did your, did you say, what relative was she? She, she was a kind of, she didn't get married again. She did? She did. She, she did. She did. Yeah. And she was a tailor. Yes. And uh, she was a busy woman. Yes. And uh, she was a spectacle in the village. A spectacle? She was a spectacle. And not a good spectacle. So she children and children were all of them. Yeah. Oh. Was she very upset by it? She was. The mother was very upset. Yeah. And it affected the whole family. Mm -hmm. So these are the sorts of problems that we want to avoid. And, and in fact, again, did she have pain or not have pain? I'm not sure about it, but I think that it really uh, was messed up. Messed up. She, she didn't do school. All her siblings did. Yeah. I think mean, she just. That's a very sad story, isn't it? And that affected her for 56 years. It wasn't just a transient thing, that was her whole life. So it's very sad, but, um, but again, we don't even know if she had pain for 50, in 56 years. So pain isn't really the thing. But why, we, why then are we treating these children? Because in history, we've tried lots of different things, including surgeries. Not we, as in me, but over history. And a lot of the surgeries have managed to make the foot look better, but caused the foot to become extremely painful. And, and that's not really a huge success, because we've done something basically for cosmetic reasons. So, um, if you meet someone with club foot, we need to know that it's a club foot. And there are lots of foot deformities in children. Um, who has seen a different foot deformity in a child? Uh, who can mention one? And they're all written up there on the screen. Has anyone seen uh, a postural club foot or had any idea? James would have seen a postural club foot because he has to decide whether club foot is what we call structural, meaning it's fixed and it doesn't correct, or postural, which is pretty supple and within a couple of weeks normally corrects with just some gentle stretches or a, or a plaster cast. So you have to make that decision, don't you? But you also have to decide, is this any sort of club foot? Or is this, for example, a calcaneal vulgus foot, which is quite obviously different because it looks like that. So we're looking at the frontal plane of the, the tibia. That side is medial. So this foot has not gone down and in like a club foot. Instead, it's gone up and out, so that's really obvious that it's not a club foot. And that's called a cut near the foot. And again, that will correct quite quickly by itself. Then, slightly more difficult to decide. Is that a club foot? Any comments? What's different about that from a club foot? Anyone want to have a go? Mr. Kincaid? Does it look like it's in Aquinas? I have a, the best answer. It's, it's not in Aquinas and down. It's just adducted in the midfoot. And you can see that adduction is most clearly seen from the sole of the foot. And sometimes you can put your hand on a baby's <coughs> foot like that, and your forefinger goes all the way up here. And if it doesn't touch, if the foot doesn't touch your forefinger, that means it's got some adductus, and that's called metatarsus adductus, and it doesn't have equinus with it. And then, here's another up and out one. This is quite rare, but it's a horrible condition to have. And can you see that the bottom of the feet is convex, so that's called a rock bottom foot, and that's a, you've got a horrible bony abnormality called the congenital vertical tapers. So, so when we're looking at club feet, we want to make sure they don't have these other things. So a bit about background. Um, Comfort's been known about for 
thousands of years and was first described in 1000 BC and I, I don't know what records show that but there is a name ascribed to someone who, who's described it a long time ago about 400 BC is when Hippocrates was making lots of philosophical comments and he said that we should strap these weird looking feet strap them into a better position so that people have been trying to treat this for thousands of years I, I was in a, a lucky enough to go to Verona in Italy about five or six years ago, and we were wandering around an art museum, uh, and actually it was a big fresco, and uh, on the right, I took a photograph of it, and it indicates a beggar there, with his right foot, you can see the right foot where I've circled it. Um, you know, he's outside the temple asking for, for support. So it's been a source of disability for hundreds of years, certainly. And it's quite common, um, Common enough for most people in this room to have seen it. So one, one, one to, to five in every thousand births, live births, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, having seen a few in Africa and Asia and the UK, I think the African foot can be quite stiff compared to some of the others, so it can be a, a difficult problem to grow, perhaps more or less a postural and more a structural. Definitely some genetics involved because uh, you find that there's a higher rate in families, um, and it's definitely associated with other syndromes, lots of syndromes that involve soft tissues and connective tissues. I'm not going to go into that, but it's quite complex and a long list. So, over that thousands of years, as you know about it, we know we've tried, people have tried strapping and plasticars and manipulation and violent manipulation and you know there is quite a lot of description trying to correct this thing really violently um, and the results haven't been super brilliant then surgery became more popular in the sort of 18th and 19th centuries the man on the right at the top is a man who lives in zambia called professor john jess and um, I was lucky enough. He, he's a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University Hospital of Lusaka. I was lucky enough to do my elective with him. That's when you leave medical school, you wouldn't know the elective is. In 1999, and, and he was a lovely man. He flew, he worked all week doing spinal surgery and stuff like that in, in the University Hospital. And then on Friday morning, we get in his aeroplane, and he flew his own little aeroplane, and we'd fly up country Zambia. We go to lots of little hospitals, much smaller than your hospital here, and we'd find they would gather their club feet together, and we would operate. We'd just operate, make a big incision right down the inside of the foot, cut all the tendons, cut all the ligaments around the hind foot and the ankle, bend the foot into the correct position, put two big K wires in. Sew up the tendons, sew up the skin, and then put them in plaster, get in the aeroplane, and fly away. And um, occasionally we come back and see how they got on. And their old feet all look pretty good. But I bet that they're now, this is 25 years later, that they're now walking around with very stiff and possibly painful feet. So that, went, that was just before the year 2000, which is about the time when Ponsetti and his method were accepted worldwide. Ponsetti is this amazing Italian chap. So we said, uh, out of order here, this has gone out of favor because Ponsetti has come into favor, right? I can tell you about Ponsetti. He's, he's this man, he died at the age of 96, I think, about six or seven years ago. Um, and he is Italian, uh, and he moved during the Second World War. I think he was a refugee from Italy, went to the United States, and he studied there and <coughs> did a lot of research into club feet. That's his whole life was club feet. And even at 96, he was still running his clinic, putting people in plasters, little babies in little baby plasters. He also wrote a big book on the left, and as a result of his work, the book on the right is now freely available on the internet, and I'd recommend anyone in the medical or paramedical professions to spend, how long did it take you, James? Three hours? Three hours. To read the whole thing. And it's good? Yeah. Tells you everything you need to know. Really brilliant. And you can get it freely on the internet on a PDF file, it takes about 
30 seconds to download, three hours to read. And his theory was that actually the hind foot, when inner club foot has a very, very specific and free, uh, and regular deformity, it's always the same, and you can always correct it in the same way. Okay? The anatomy, that you don't need to know much about the anatomy in terms of which ligaments are, are, are tight, which are thick, which are, are, are stiff. But you will see children and they have um, the club foot and they, they have a small calf. Sometimes the foot is small, sometimes the leg is a bit shorter. It's all part of the same condition. And that's not teratological, that's not in a syndromic problem, that's just what club foot is. They always have these deformities. This is what we call, uh, you can remember cave. That's cavus adductus, towards the inside. Varus, meaning that the hind foot is swung inverted. And um, E for equinus, which is like a horse's foot, means that the ankle is down. So cave, that's what you need to remember, and when you're trying to correct the problem, you correct C-A-V, not in, uh, it, sorry, in that order, that's correct. And the reason you can correct it is because all the ligaments and tendons that are tight have what is called crimp. It's wavy fibers, like a spring. So when you pull on the fibers, they go straight, which allows this bit of, little bit of elasticity. So when you are correcting these feet, you stretch out that crib, so all the fibers go straight, and then you plant straight like that. And what happens over the next four or five days is that the fibers crimp again, but they don't get shorter, they just crimp again. And then you come back four or five days later and you can stretch again. And then they slowly crimp and you stretch again. And that is how it works. That's why we managed to do it. So the, tr the, the big issue with Ponsetti is to get the family to come along with you, um, especially if there's any suspicion between the culture you're in and the um, and the health service and tradition uh, and sorry modern medical services. Who can tell me? Who has a comment about Dr. Dogma? I see you there. Tell me about how your patients see you as a doctor. Do they trust you all the time? Are there some, are there some parts of the population that trust you and others that do not? <coughs> That's right, okay. And the, the, is that right? That's not fair, is it? Do, do the mothers and women take you seriously, or do some of them prefer to see a traditional healer? Um, one of them, one of them, the region, they're here. Exactly. You think that's why they're here. Do, we, do you think, as a doctor, you understand how many people don't come to this hospital because they don't really believe in modern medicine? From this side, most of them, yes, usually come to having sorts of traditional when it's failed, when they haven't had success. And we'll have a right in thinking that could be weeks or months. Yeah. So that's the two problems I see with that. One is that they may have had treatment that's done them some harm, which we sometimes see, I think. But also, if the problem that they need treating is time critical, they may have lost time. Okay. And I would think this is a well, both categories, but especially the second category. Um, so you, it, even in the UK, where generally people trust modern medicine and they, they present promptly for their child to be treated, they, there's still a huge commitment from the family. They've got to, the family's got to be prepared to have their brand new baby that they've never held their baby before, and then suddenly it's going to have to have plasters. Like this. Okay? Who wants a baby that they can't touch their skin and they can't cuddle it and it's got 
plasters on and they have to show it to other friends <coughs> and it's got a problem and they don't, they're embarrassed that the baby's not perfect. So there's a difficulty there. The plaster's going to stay on for anything between six and ten weeks, so that's a long time. And then it doesn't finish because they then need to have, in 80% of the time, they need a mini operation, so the, the parents got to be there to hold their child while a doctor cuts them. And, and many parents don't like the idea of that very much. And then after that, the child needs to go into a pair of boots and a bar between their boots like this for five years. Okay? Three months is going to be all the time, but five years, every night for five years. And the, the child's got to sleep in these things. And then even after that, they need to have follow-up regularly until they grow up. And they still may get a problem because this technique is probably only 95% successful. T up to 10% will need a small operation later in the life. So the family have got to be totally committed, and that's a big problem, and I think it could be an even bigger problem in other countries where there's <coughs> challenges of poverty, difficulty in traveling, um, multiple siblings, they also need looking after by the family, etc. Et anyway, if, if we can persuade um, families to commit, it, it's sensible to do an initial assessment. This doesn't change the fact that you still have to treat them, but it's quite a nice way of measuring them. James and I are going to talk about this. Um, it's quite a commitment, but there's a score, the most commonly used is called Pirani score, and it just quantifies the severity of the clubfoot, and it allows you, it allows the treater to quantify the improvement every week, if, if there's time to do it. Um, so then we talk about the plasters. Now, James is going to come up and, um, James, please come up and you can show us um, how we go about this. Now, James has got here a model, a big model, and we've got some small models. So, yeah, that's the Jaguar 2 down at I'll take these down here. Oh, that's got one. <laughs> oh, no, it's got light chocolate. <laughs> Me and the fan from the. Uh, from the uh, uh, do you want to hand that one? <coughs> I've got my sticky now. So, James has got a full size model. What we've handed out um, <coughs> a plasticine model of the deformity, um, three out of four, um, and one out of two of them have got a very severe deformity, and one of them has got a partially corrected deformity. And oh, thank you. That's so um, James has got a model. Now, this model is clearly not a baby's foot, um, it, but we, we're using a bigger model so you can see. And uh, what you're going to do is demonstrate the deformity. And, and by doing so, I hope you can see that the deformity is basically around the talus, which is the ankle bone. The ankle bone that sits at the bottom of the tibia talus, and then around that, and that's in the right place, although it's equine, it's flexed down, which is the equine. It is the rest of the foot that is deformed around that bone. And the components here are um, a cabus, so actually on this side of the foot, if you turn that way a bit, on this side of the foot, all those hard to see on this model, there is cavus here, so you end up with a very big arch. The second is adductus, so looking from the front, the foot, foot is adducted around the talus. The third is um, varus, so the whole foot has come in, including the hind foot, is, and the heel is tucked in. And then the equinus, the E of the cave, is where the whole ankle is planted. So to correct this, the baby comes in um, and they're gently, gently manipulated. The first thing to manipulate is, um, you didn't know about hands, so do you have a hands? The first thing to manipulate, if you turn that way a bit, is the cables. So the, 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 um, the doctor puts their thumb on the tailor head, sorry, uh, which is here. Because the deformity is around the tailor, we stabilize the tailor. So your the thumb will go on the side of the tailor head there. And the first thing is to lift the first ray to get rid of the case. Um, the second thing is then to 
together with the adductors, which involves pushing the foot sideways like that, again with the thumb on the tailor head, like that. So the foot is really nicely abducted. And as we do that, the heel at the back goes from being tucked in, it swings naturally around. It doesn't need pushing, it corrects like that all by itself. So we're bringing that around there, and the heel comes out like that, all by itself. And then the last thing to correct is the equinus, at which point the whole foot is brought up. And that just seemed, Ponset, Mr. Ponsetti worked, Dr. Ponsetti worked out that that's the way you can do it, and it unfolds, it unlocks the foot, and then it corrects. Thank you, Jim. Um, and in 80% of the patients, the only thing is they can't quite get enough equinus. What you can do is cut the heel cord, the Achilles tendon, with a knife in the clinic, and it pops up and you get a lovely, normal range of motion. And then the tendon heals in about two weeks, amazingly, all by itself. So that process happens over usually about six weeks. And after each manipulation, you put on an above knee plaster. And so the plasters in turn look like those up on the screen. And, and so every week, the child, every five to seven days, the child comes back for a new manipulation, a new plaster. Once that's done, and you've got the, the foot into a lovely corrected position, the child needs to be fitted with, a, with boots and a bar like that. It doesn't matter what they're made of, they can make anything as long as they fit well. And they hold the feet in the corrected position, or the foot. And even if you've only got one foot, you put both in the bar and the boots because it, both, you need both feet in to keep the bar still to correct the bad foot. Okay. So, how am I doing the time? Anyone? Can I? We've got a four minute video of um, plastering here. It's half past. Um, I'll come back to that later. Just wanted to talk a little bit about <coughs> what this means in Kenya, because it's all very easy to do in the NHS where we've got oodles of money and lots and lots of doctors and unlimited supplies of plaster casts, or we, we wish we had. But we certainly have probably more resources than in Kenya. Um, here, and in lots and lots of parts of the world, uh, there are very, very few doctors. And each, I think, in Danny, you look after a million people, is that right? Or two million? Or was it 10 million? <laughs> and, um, so, I don't think you've got time to do all this, and in, even in the UK we don't do it. What we, we have, in my hospital it's physiotherapists, in other hospital it's a children's physiotherapist, and in some hospitals it might be the occupational therapist. Um, here you've got James, who's an OT, and um, probably an orthotist as well, you? really. But it really can be anyone, it doesn't have to be any, any particularly trained person. It, they just need to be trained in how to do this. So if any of you were interested, you could just get involved and help out. It's a most incredibly satisfying thing to do because you take a, per, a, a baby who might otherwise go on to be like your cousin, a whole lifetime of, of disability and social disability, and within six weeks you can transform their lives without any surgery, no scarring, no stiffness, and you see the family just get happy in front of you. It's a really satisfying thing to do. So if anyone wants to get involved, I'm sure that you could find either in this hospital or anywhere, outreach clinics, other hospitals, um, I don't know your personal circumstances, but it's a really worthwhile thing to do. So anyone can do it. You probably do need a surgeon or someone with some surgical training to do the autonomy because the anatomy is like, there are some nerves nearby and arteries and you need to know where those are. Um, you don't need much equipment, you just need um, swollen um, and plaster. Literally, that's all you need. So, um, in Bangladesh, we used to get six inch wool, the 15 centimeter wool, and cut it into two, in, in two places to make three rolls of two inch. And you don't need to have it packed as two inch, you can just make it yourself. And you add, um, cannibalize some other plasters. Very hard to cut because we're going to discard water at some time, but we do. Do you need facilities? You literally need, uh, 
You don't need anything. You can do this on the parents who are in the wide open air. You could go to a village, take a bucket of water, some plaster, and just do it in a wide open space. You need nothing um, in terms of facilities. If you're going to do the tenotomy, you probably need a little squab with some alcohol or some better things so and just clean the skin. And enough. Um, follow up. Well, trouble we had in, uh, in um, Bangladesh in particular is that people would travel for miles because they didn't really know what was involved or that they wanted their child seen. We'd start on SETI and then they'd travel for miles back home and then they'd forget to come or they usually couldn't afford the bus or whatever it was and we lost them completely to follow up. And you don't know who they are or where they live, you don't know if they gave you their right name or indeed how you should spell it, etc. 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 Since mobile phones, that has been so much better and in months of it, uh, Dr. Kincaid was telling me that they don't use hospital numbers at all, do they? They just, their only ID is their mobile phone, which is great because you know, you know how to get hold of them as well. Um, and since mobile phones, it's been much easier to keep tabs on patients, encourage them to come back to follow up, send them an SMS to say, don't forget to come for your chance, new plaster, blah, blah, blah. And then who's going to oversee it, make it happen? And it's nice to have someone like Dr. Ndanya who can sort of say, if, uh, if you have any problems, come to me, I can sort them out, you know, have it, are we on track, shall we all get the results? But it's by no means essential. <coughs> James is running the service. Um, I think for a while, if the, uh, Dr. Ndanya wasn't available, and James carried on running the service. He did a brilliant job all by himself. And um, it's good to keep a log so you know who you've treated, how you're doing, what the numbers are, how many have a tenotomy, that sort of thing. Um, but that can just be a log book, I mean, just a piece of paper. So really, it couldn't be more affordable and more achievable. It's probably the most affordable and achievable treatment you can give anyone for anything. So there's, there's no real reason not to do it. The boots and bars are going to cost some money, some, but they can be made locally. Uh, they just need some cobbler who can make some leather boots that fit the child. And the hospital, for example, could have, it, one way of doing it would be to have three or four sets um, so that you, they can be used and returned and the next patient could have them. Um, it's, it's not, it, 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 in the scheme of healthcare, it's one of the chief things. So I think this is this is why it's revolutionised the world, and um, it's revolutionised this condition which we've got. In. Occasionally, in the UK, we we follow people up quite carefully, and occasionally, and this is accepted in Ponsetti, um, a, a five to ten percent might need a small operation later in their lives because um, there's been some recurrence. And, and typically what we do is we just do a couple of Ponsetti plasters again just to stretch the tissues to get a correction again. And sometimes we need to transfer or lengthen the tendon. So that's we lengthening a tendon at the back, the Achilles, to re-lengthen that. Or to move a tendon at the front of the foot called the tibialis anterior, which tends to pull the foot in a bit, move it to the outside of the foot so it pulls out. And that usually solves the problem. So occasionally they need small tendon surgery, but it doesn't stiffen the foot, doesn't um, stop their growth, uh, and it's not usually painful. So in conclusion, um, you need to, what we've talked about today is um, identifying the deformity. Make sure it's a club foot and you're treating what you think you're treating. Number two, Ponsetti management is the gold standard throughout the world in all countries. It's not a second class treatment, it's the first class treatment everywhere in the world. It's not, just because it's cheap, easy and effective, doesn't mean it's not the best treatment. You start the treatment as soon as you can, but the, sometimes the children are so small it's very hard to manipulate their feet and it's worth waiting a few weeks just till they're a bit bigger. Big baby can start straight away. We talked about big fat babies, didn't we? I don't know if you get many of those in Kenya. But big chubby babies have legs which are all blubbery and fat and you can't feel the bones. It's sometimes worth waiting for them to just grow a bit longer. Or we even talk to mum about how much bottle they're giving the baby at night. Um, 
you expect to do it to not be in most of them. And the real difficulty for the stream is to get the family to believe in it and to pers and to persist with it. Okay, and that's the challenge. So um, I don't know the answer to that. Do you? How do you do that here? Yeah, you have to look them in the eye and say, believe, trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> okay. And I just show you this quick video. Um, how can make it work? Just a bit, we were probably only going to have to see all of it. Well, that solved that problem. Um, <laughs> we won't have video. Um, so, we've got for 20 minutes or something for anyone to ask questions because this is something that all of you, well, many of you have seen, so you've probably got your questions already. Um, you know, what questions have you thought of when you've seen these babies? And, uh, or have I, has any of this prompted you to want to ask any questions? No? Mr. Mr. McCann. What would you do for uh, an adult who presents with club foot that said 25 year old who's had no treatment at all, has got no pain, but is unhappy with the way they've all done Well, you know, obviously you ask them why they presented, if, um, if all of that's true. Uh, but the answer is, well, if I can sort of expand on the question, if up to two, upon setting works really quite well. Um, for the most of the child and adolescents, uh, Ponseti's good starting point to see how good a correction you can get before you consider surgery. But the short answer to your question is it depends on what the patient wants. There's no mandatory uh, need to operate or to correct the foot as demonstrated from a, from a physiological point of view and an anatomical point of view and probably a functional point of view. You don't have to do it. But from a cosmetic point of view, it can be important for people. Um, and if they have developed pain or ulceration over the top of their foot, uh, or they need to wear footwear but for the job that they can't, those are all relatively uh, relative indications to operate. But the answer is, it will need surgery. And then the second part of the question is, can you do surgery um, the three types of surgery. One is to change the shape of their bones, but not their joints, and that's probably not painful. The results won't be painful, but the correction may be incomplete. If you start doing joint surgery without fusions, that's when you get pain and arthritic problems. <coughs> and the third is to do big fusions, um, which are things like big triple fusions, non-renewed triple fusions, that's so those are big operations where you remove some of the joints of the foot and take off um, and change the shape of the bones before fusing the bones together. It tends to make the foot stiffer and probably not too painful for a period. But inevitably, once you start on the process of operating on adults, it probably lead to future arthritic problems. Um, does that answer the question? Thank you. <coughs> Um, oh, here's a, here's Gus, I'll do the talking because he's talking very uh, quietly in an American accent. Um, so the plaster is going to be a, a bath knee plaster that you see you stop the plaster there. You have to have two people, there's a person holding the toes, and he's not actually doing the manipulation, he's just, that they've done a stretch and now the assistant is holding the thigh and the toes, whilst this, uh, the plaster is wrapping the plaster fairly firmly because otherwise it becomes a bit baggy. Um, it's two inch wide, as you can see, and he's smoothing it as he goes down, and he's gonna do the plaster up to the knee. Okay. And at this point, therefore, it doesn't matter that the child is kicking the knee because we're not trying to uh, get the above knee plaster. But when we do, when you change it to above knee, it's going to go from 90 degrees at the knee so it doesn't fall off. Okay, so he's, cut, he's finished the plaster layers he wants to use and he's now going to manipulate. Now, this is the important part. The plaster, who is the technician, is taking over. Do you see where his left thumb is? Now, that is on the tailor head. So that's the whole point. He's stabilizing the tailors here. 
So he's, I know it's the other side, but he's basically got his thumb on the tail head here, which he's found by coming down on his fibula, going slightly anteriorly, and he's onto the tail head, head just here. But he's not keeping his thumb in one place all the time because he'll just get a big thumbprint and that can cause a pressure sore on the skin. So he's moving his thumb. Sure, move that. There we are. You see, he's moving his thumb around. And now he's lifting. Can you see with his right hand, he's lifting that first ray. Nice flat hand so it's not causing a dent. Lifting the first ray to get rid of the cables. And you'll see at the end of this video when he turns to see the foot straight on. The foot is still very supinated, it's, it's not flat, it's very supinated because he's lifted that first ray as the first part of the correction. So, guys, just to clarify that the above knee bit is just to stop the fast skin, right? Well, it has two front rods. Two rolls. At this stage, it's just to stop the plaster falling out. When you get to the correction of the adductus, that's a big rotation correction. So if you only have a below knee, you don't really control the rotation surface. It becomes more and more important. Well, manipulation doesn't work, that's okay. And then 
Um, it wasn't until Consetti so clearly described the sequential nature of this, including the first plaster that corrects the cavus, makes the foot look worse rather than better. And parents struggle to cope with that. And you have to breathe them. You have to breathe them. You have to gain their trust. They have to trust you as a doctor. And when you get to a doctor, to Daniel standing, you can speak with confidence and say, I know you won't trust me, but this is the correct thing, and he will he find it easier to get a parent's trust than someone who's a little bit less certain about it. So you have to be certain and confident and believe it, and you then to believe it yourself, you really need to see it happen a few times, and even do it like James does. And, you know, you, you talk to James about Ponsetti, his eyes light up because it's such a a miracle cure, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, and he gets the pleasure <coughs> of doing that miracle to people because it's um, But you're right, it has to be in order and the, it has to go cavus, adductus, varus, equinus last, and, that, and the equinus is what the parents want to be done first, which creates this conflict. Anyone else? Okay, well, if you do have any questions, or indeed you want to have a copy of the photographs and the video links, you're very welcome to ask Duncan, you'll have, I'll send it to you now. Um, if you want to ask me anything uh, in person, you're very, very welcome to. And I think um, James has got a couple of patients coming in, one or two this week, maybe even today, or tomorrow? Yeah, not today. today. So, um, if anyone wants to come and just see the process actually live, would you mind? Yeah, you can go. You can go. <laughs> We're not telling you where. <laughs> see, that's what I'm saying. I'm hoping you tell me. <laughs> okay? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>